We are entering the time of year when regret for players that aren't working out really start to set in and become real. So regardless of what your record is, use this video to send specific trade offers to as many people as you can for these players and make sure to stick around to the end of the video because there will be one player that is the literal best buy low possibly of the entire year, I guarantee send a trade offer for him. Also, a little bit of a list of some sell highs at the end. And as we get into it, hit that like button if you do want to support me. It helps me out a ton as a creator. And subscribe if you like these videos every week. But whether you like Debo Samuel or not, he is one of the best buy lows. The first guy on this list, the owners of Debo Samuel most likely are not above 500 in their record so far. He missed a game. He's had two pretty bad games. And if we look at his last two performances, you can see why exactly he is a buy low. The first, five targets, three receptions, 58 yards against a pretty easy Patriots team. And then last week, that's followed up by three targets one reception 11 yards that's just not good against an even worse cardinals defense like they're just known to not have a good secondary and allow a lot of points he only had 11 yards and he might be the wide receiver 41 right now averaging 12 and a half fantasy points a game but his biggest issues or issues i guess aren't even his fault because we look at everybody else in this offense when Debo was out in week three Jawan jennings had his legacy game of 175 yards three touchdowns and 46 fantasy points. Then that was followed by Brandon Ayuk last week in week five. He had 147 yards, 22.7 fantasy points. Now the Debo owners are looking at him like, where is that for me? Like I took him this early in drafts for a reason. Debo has just not been producing. But the truth is, regardless of whatever Tiger competition we have in this offense, he is still a big name and he's a very primary part of this offense as well. His name value alone is going to keep him this high to where if he drops an 18 plus point fantasy week like he was in week one and two, you're not going to be able to get him. He's going to be untouchable. And again, we don't have to look back in his game logs too far to see that he is efficient. Only three weeks ago, he was the wide receiver 10. Even last year, you can look at his game logs. Nothing's changed. This offense is the exact same. And he even gets more utilization in the run game without Christian McCaffrey, who we won't have for who knows how much longer. So he is a good buy low player. If you need help trying to figure out who to send for him or what trade packages to make, depending on who you actually have on your roster, go ahead and comment it down below. I will be helping everybody as much as I can with your trade questions. But another really high draft capital guy that we can get for pennies compared to his draft position is Brees Hall. And like Debo Samuel, there's a bunch of issues going on in this offense and outside of him specifically that are making him a better buy low because people see the inefficiency in fancy points and just immediately blame him for the issue. Now, he definitely hasn't been good. He's the RB13, averaging 14.3 fantasy points a week, and we have definitely seen how low his floor can be over the past couple weeks. But again, those aren't really his issues. In week three against the Broncos, really the first week of his inefficiency and the problems beginning, it was against the Broncos in a game that had terrible weather. The total score of that game was only 19 points. That was way more of a game issue because both sides of the ball were struggling than it was Brees Hall's specific issue of inefficiency in fantasy points. You can also look at that Vikings game and see they were down early and often, which is why Aaron Rodgers had over 50 pass attempts, which is not normal. But what everybody is looking at in the real concerning part for Brees Hall is that his volume is going down. If we look at his last few games, or I guess all of the games this season, 16 carries to 14 to 16 again, then to 10 and to nine the past two weeks. Those last two weeks also, he finished with 3.8 and 6.7 fantasy points. Like that is nowhere near a first round, if not first five pick in the draft guy that we were getting. And 99% of people are gonna look at this decrease in usage and say, okay, he's just not good. He's not efficient anymore. Braylon Allen has come into this offense. He's getting touches. He has to be taking from Brees Hall. He's a really bad player. We gotta sell him high as soon as possible. He has no guarantee in this offense anymore. That's just not true. And the hype for Braylon Allen is real. He's rostered in about 60% of leagues, averaging 8.3 fantasy points a game as a rookie in an offense that was supposed to be only Brees's. But again, the real reason that his numbers are falling off specifically and pretty much Brees Hall as a whole as a player is because this offense has been struggling. It is almost a guarantee that this Jets offense is going to go back to the run game a lot more because they've pretty much abandoned it. They're 25th in running attempts. They're top 10 in passing attempts, though. It, there's a huge difference. They just fired Robert Sala, their head coach. They should lean on the run game a ton more. Everything's pointing towards it. Brees has been fine. They've just been limiting in the entire running back room of touches. And the great thing about him is that he is still, one, a red zone running back, really good there. Two, a really good receiving running back. He had 38 route run compared to eight for Braylon Allen last week. Like, that is a dominant number. But that only came down with four targets. Out of 38 routes, you only have four targets. Like, that's not good. It's gonna come up. His target share over the past four weeks before has been really good. You can just get him for so low right now. Use a guy like Ramondre Stevenson, a guy like Javante Williams even. Package them in a trade to get Brees. Again, if you have any questions about who to trade, let me know in the comments. Another top tier guy I would 100% be sending an offer for, and this is probably the last week you can do it, 
is Cooper Cup and maybe even Puka if you want that as well. This Rams offense is struggling so much without these two wide receivers in this offense. They're still top 10 in passing attempts. I believe they're sixth, but their actual passing yards and passing efficiency numbers are insanely different from that pass attempt number. They need these guys back. And we saw a dominant Cooper Cup performance in week one where he had 21 targets. Uh, like he had six targets in the second week when he only played half before he got injured on track for another double digit target game. So imagine what this top 10 passing offense is gonna look like when they're back. We don't have to imagine. We've seen it before. Cooper Cup had a triple crown season. Both of these guys value is just lower by default because they haven't been playing. They're coming off pretty major injuries. Cooper Cup is expected to come back in week seven after their bye week this week in week six. Puka could be another few weeks from now. We do know he will be a top five wide receiver rest of season. Even with Puka in there, there's enough passing volume to go around. This offense runs through these guys. But the number one best buy low, I guarantee you, is Devon HN right now. And literally everything that could possibly go wrong is going wrong for him. If we just look at these numbers to get things started, he suffered a concussion in week five, so he didn't end up playing the whole game. He only had 14 snaps that led to three carries, 18 yards, one reception for negative one yards. Already a pretty bad fantasy day in that aspect. So that's already kind of leaving a bad vibe for the people that have HN on their team. On top of that, he's off to a really rocky start. Without Tua in this offense, he's been averaging 21 rushing yards a game and 11 total touches and only 5.8 fantasy points. That's the RB56. It quite literally does not get worse than that. All on top of the fact that we probably aren't going to have Tua back for at least until week eight. Now, I do fully believe Tua is going to come back. Every report, everything that's come out about Tua is saying that he is going to come back in the season, in the regular season, and honestly, pretty soon. So this is the perfect time to buy Devon HN because as the news of Tua coming back actually gets closer, after he gets through his bye week, after he gets away from his concussion, everything's going to be ramping up and people aren't going to be able to get him as low as the value is right now. The Dolphins record is also two and three. Like it's not terrible. It could be a lot worse if they were one and four or even zero oh and five. Tua would not have any incentive to really come back and this team would kind of lose hope. They're in a position to still make the playoffs very much so. And let's not forget Devon Achan's numbers through the first two weeks with Tua. He has 23 touches a game compared to 11 without him. That's a massive difference. And he is still a dual threat running back that gets a ton of usage in the pass game. He runs a ton of routes. You can use running backs like Zach Moss or Andre Stevenson, Javante Williams to get him on your team, package him that way. If you want to send an offer for Jalen Waddle or Tyreek Hill, I also would do that. Tua coming back into this offense is just completely going to turn everybody around. Their value is not going to be lower. But if you like the buy lows that aren't the top cream of the crop kind of players that are a little bit hard to trade for, here are some guys that you can trade for that are easy, not as high quality players like Tank Dell. He's a great option here. He has not looked great in this offense so far. He's the wide receiver 72, averaging 7.4 fantasy points a game. That is not what we drafted him to be. Now, granted, I do think his draft stock was way too high to begin with, and he's kind of now where he should be, but he's still running a good amount of routes. Yes, his snap percentage isn't 100%, but he's running just about the same number of routes as Stefan Diggs, as Nico Collins is. If you look at last week, Stefan Diggs ran 59, he ran 48. The weeks before that, he's still within a seven route run difference, despite not being on the field for 100% of the snaps. Neither is Diggs, he's only on the field for 80%. Now, Nico Collins is also dealing with a hamstring injury it's said to be week to week. I don't expect it to be anything longer than maybe a one week thing. So maybe that makes Tank Dell a little bit harder to trade for. If anything, we should be getting him just in the case that Nico Collins does happen to miss a game where this injury does happen to linger. But the reason everybody liked Tank Dell in the beginning of the year is because he built that chemistry with CJ Stroud. He's a downfield threat. CJ Stroud has more than enough passing volume. He's averaging like 300 passing yards a game. I would trade receivers like Dontavian Wicks, like Wondell Robinson, or even players off the waiver wire that you can pick up that are absolute trash and just flip them alongside other guys. You always want to be doing two for one trades to get that better one unless you're tanked and have no depth. But regardless, you can pick up some waiver guys that have pretty good weeks and flip them. If you want to know the traps on the waiver wire that had good weeks but are not valuable at all, go check out the video I just posted yesterday. That video is always a banger every Tuesday. People love those. Go check it out. I'll pin it right here. But Jacoby Myers is another one of those lower level wide receivers that should be easier to trade for. Now, the main reason he's on this list is because I fully expect Devontae Adams to leave this team. He was inactive last week with a hamstring injury. He doesn't want to play. The team doesn't want to get him injured because they want decent draft capital from him. He doesn't want to be on this team. Now, I, I do expect him to leave, which makes Jacoby Myers the number one option and wide receiver. I do think Brock Bowers is going to be the best option out of this entire offense. It's too late to buy low on him now, though. Last week kind of proved that fact. But Adams being gone frees up about eight targets a game. They have to go somewhere. Jacoby Myers already sees a decent target share. 
Now, the quarterback situation is tough. We're dealing with O'Connell and Minshew. Who knows who's going to start for the rest of the season? Either way, this Raiders defense has not been as good as we expected. They tend to be down in games, which means pass first script, which also means good for the receivers. It doesn't really matter if this offense is terrible. They're still going to get targets, especially if you're the wide receiver one. You can be serviceable, which is exactly why his value is so low. Once Adams actually leaves, you're not going to be able to get him for what he's worth. But as promised, a quick list of these sell high players we need to be getting rid of. I promise you, you don't want them on your team if you do have them. I foreshadowed it earlier in the video. Sell Javante Williams if you have him. I have him on one of my teams. I'm looking to trade him as fast as possible. He managed to have a great game as far as Broncos standards go last week with 16 fantasy points, 13 carries, 6 targets out of the backfield as well, which is really, really good. And he strung together two pretty good weeks back to back, so it's a lot harder to trade for those one week wonder guys that have like one 40 point game like Jawan Jennings and then nothing after or before that. He strung together two. But there is so much risk in this Broncos backfield. If we look at the last five weeks, the leading guy in rushing attempts has pretty much changed every single week. In week one, it was McLaughlin, then it was Javante Williams, then it was McLaughlin again, then it was Aldrick Estime, then it was Javante Williams. Sean Payton does not care who is in this offense. If you can run the ball, you're getting touches. Like, Aldrick Estime is a real competition for usage in this backfield when he comes back healthy. Even Tyler Bidet was here getting usage. The only good thing about this Broncos backfield is that Sean Payton, for the past 10 years, pretty much every single year he's been a head coach or in charge of the offense, his backfield has finished top five in targets in total out of the entire NFL. And if you look at his target total and just his routes run, Javante Williams does get usage in the receiving game. But there's no guarantee that goes to him outside of the other running backs here because there's so much competition. He only sees 60% of the snaps. And the last game for the Broncos was really a fluke. How often are the Broncos going to be winning games by a large amount and be able to stick to their run heavy script? It's not going to be very often. If you just look at the past weeks where they're getting blown out, which is a usual thing, it doesn't look good for the running backs. It's not good already when you're in a committee backfield, but when you're in a committee backfield on an offense that ranks 28th in the entire NFL, it's even worse. And he doesn't have an edge in the receiving game. He ran 16 routes compared to Jaleel McLaughlin at 11. I guarantee you when Audrick Estime comes back healthy, he's going to get involved in there too. Not to mention the Broncos schedule as far as running back points allowed for the next few weeks and even the rest of the year is so tough. But speaking of committee backfields, Ramondre Stevenson is another guy I really want to sell off of my team. There was some news about him not being the starter this week, or I guess it was last week. He comes out, gets a touchdown, probably his most efficient game of the year. Now we have to be real. One, the Dolphins defense isn't necessarily amazing. Two, their offense is absolutely terrible. So again, the Patriots can play within their play style, run the ball, play slow, and rely on their defense. But how often are the Patriots team going to be within a touchdown where they can do that? The answer is not many games. Ramondre has three touchdowns through five games for a Patriots running back or anybody on the Patriots in general. That is an insanely high clip because they're only scoring about one, maybe two a game. He is very, very risky. I do think he's going to lead this backfield with Antonio Gibson in there, but they're both going to take usage. They both are really good in the receiving game. They also both have fumbling issues, so who really knows what's going to go on. Here are some other sell-high candidates, though. If you have any of these guys, you can look to trade them. Make sure to drop your trade comments in the comment section of this video. I want to help out as many people as I can. Thank you for sticking around in this one.